two o or nine o two on uh, uh, Monday, uh, November second. I'm going to go ahead and call the executive cabinet meeting for the board of county commissioners to order. Let the record reflect that we have all three commissioners present. And uh, first item of business is uh, Mr. Mike Burgess in legislative priorities discussion. Mike, thanks for joining us. Hello, commissioners and everyone else. Um, we're pretty close to being done putting this document together. Um, thanks to Jared for his help um, and make it look good. And um, I think some of the urgency was too in that I know that um, GSI is looking at getting their agenda finalized and we want to have, we have some pieces here that want to make sure that get included in that. And then also, um, I don't know, you guys probably heard there's an election tomorrow. And after that, we'll uh, get our, um, get have this finalized and then we can reach out to the delegation, um, depending on who is or isn't elected and have a discussion with them about our priorities and transition to start in session in January. Um, all indications are, I think I've mentioned this before, that uh, session will be all remote. Um, given that reality, it will severely limit the amount of legislation that is passed or even considered for that matter. Um, but that's why I think there's a, but I do think there will be a good sized capital budget. Those are the indications I've heard. And so I think it's good that we've got some good projects on here to ask for. In fact, I'll talk to Jared. I think visually I want to switch those to the, this document, but that's a housekeeping uh, housekeeping item. Um, but just running down the list, nothing here is new. Um, we've got the, if you start on the first part there, you've got the general legislation, uh, it's kind of like the unfunded mandate-ish section mentioning um, uh, um, criminal justice and those types of things. Um, to GMA, we'll, we'll see some legislation on that as we've talked about. You all had uh, mentioned broadband access, so we included that. And then <clears throat> it's not new to you, but it's new to the list, the Unified um, Guardianship Act. Um, I've spoken to your court administrator about that and then my colleagues that lobby the issue as well. So um, those are timely and good to have on there. Um, I guess before you switch to the second page, do you have any comments or changes you'd like to make? Um, looks like maybe we need to make a little bit of a format change with the first one just visually, but from a content standpoint, anything else that you'd like to add or think about putting on? Okay, any comments from uh, Commissioner Kearns or Commissioner Cooney? Are we good with what we've got here? Um, well, we just received it this morning, so um, I haven't looked at it to wordsmith it, but I mean, it, it looks good. I mean, on, on the face of it and the topics and, and all of that, so. Yeah, sure thing, uh, Commissioner. Um, yeah, from a content standpoint, we like you say wordsmith we might need to change a few things in format but in terms of the issues it's really different or new um but if um if you do end up having new ones you know we can this can be a living breathing document too we can constantly change it um but for once we kind of get it to the legislature you know we're going to kind of be with the way it is but we we have weeks to do that. um on to the second page We've got the capital budget requests. And so there's four of them there that are not new to you. Um, I changed the verbiage on the, the Fairchild Air Force Base. Um, I still need some help with discussing that. And I know that Jared had reached out to, to Todd, to Melky about getting some maybe additional language through the sheriff's office on that as well so would we'll be open to any suggestions on better ways to word those things but i think those are a good list of things to ask for um i i have talked to my colleague with the valley about the fairgrounds um request and 
it sounds like their staff wants to go forward with that. I don't, and that last meeting it wasn't our last, we talked <clears throat> the time before that when the, the staff from the Valley came, they were gonna present some things to their council. They were gonna go forward with it and then let you all know that they were moving forward. And I don't know if you as a group have decided that that formally is a project we wanna support. I was operating under that assumption. I think there might have been some confusion, Mike, that with our friends out in the valley about was it competing with some other needs that we had asked for, and I think they clarified, or we tried to clarify that it was a standalone, uh, had nothing to do with some of the other requests. So the last I heard was that it was presented to their council and they were moving ahead. Right. Are we in a good spot for that as well? I think we are. I, I think we are. I think it's it's a benefit to us, um, to the county, and to our facilities, and you know, and then benefits the the valley as well. Okay, and then you've got the the other three: the medical examiner, Norris Morrison, the Fairchild um, range. Um, do we have additional, or is this kind of where we're locked in now at this point? So on the range for Fairchild, I'm going to give you some suggested uh, alternative language on that. Uh, that. That language implies that it's heavy on the sheriff's office when it really should be heavy on the Fairchild. Fairchild's probably going to be using about 80% of this facility. So it's more about supporting Fairchild and the Air Force than it is uh, uh, the, the uh, sheriff. That's great. Thanks, Commissioner. Understood. I just didn't know the credit quite the right word it so I would appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. We'll get you some we'll get you some language on that. Okay. And then the last is um, the transportation requests and still probably need to make some adjustments there. Um, but um, in terms of the bulk of what we're doing, I think we're in a good spot. So we can make those changes there, but in but overall I think We've got this in a pretty good position. With regard to the Hayford Geiger Road 902 interchange, uh, a group of us met with uh, Mike Gribner with WashDOT uh, Friday, and so I should have uh, more direction on that for you this week. Okay. Get, yeah, get that to Jared and I, and then I think we're in, um, at least from my perspective, I mean, obviously you three matter in your vote more than I do. Um, but uh, just yeah. in the general shape of it, does this agenda look the right way um, moving forward? And we'll do some of that cleanup. Do you have anything you want to add, subtract, change, modify, adjust? Well, I think it speaks to what we've, we've talked about. Okay. Josh, you okay? Okay. We'll get you some. Quick edits here and uh, then you can bring it back in final form. Okay, that's all I needed, Commissioners. I'll leave you to it. And uh, thank you. Is, Anything is there, else, unless you have any other questions for me? Well, I want to ask is there anything we want to include um, or regarding PDAs or around the PDAs? Is there anything that have we talked about anything over the year, uh, over the last 12 months that we think you know could benefit? the the PDAs that we possibly include? You know, the the only thing we, we might want to uh, uh, provide some language that uh, uh, harmonizes state statutes as it relates to port districts to uh, include port districts and public development authorities. We could probably do that. What do you think of that? Well, I, 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 I don't know exactly what we want. I'm just thinking, you know, it's an opportunity, you know, with their, you know, we've spent so much time and uh, an effort with, with our PDAs. I just wasn't sure if there's any, you know, any, any type of language or policies that we think could, could help strengthen them. So what, whatever it is. I yeah. mean, I, I think, no, it's a great question. Great question. I hadn't thought about it. So um, let's, let's see if we can put some meat on that this week. Okay. Because we had, Josh, are you referring to things like, I'm going to use the Northeast for an example, that we've got quite a few infrastructure needs that 
you know, that we might want to figure out a way to ask for some help from the legislature on those. You know, we have, all those, we have all those unpaved roads and we've got some sewer issues and all that other stuff out there. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's one option. I mean, ju just any, anything under the sun that could, could help strengthen or give the PDAs more tools. Um, you know, what, what, what are some of those ideas? And, that's, you know, I mean, it, 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 yep. at a time where I, I think a lot of people are going to be focused on, yeah, how do we, how do we get the economy churning again? You know, what, what can we do to, to help, um, you know, to help our economic drivers? You know, PD, you know, PDA legislation might be something. I don't know. No, it's a great observation. Let's let's take a look at it and see what we can do. Yeah, we can, you know, I I made some notes, Commissioner. Maybe we under our uh, general legislation, we can add a narrative there about if there is legislation to introduce uh, supporting those efforts. And I'll talk to um, Jim Hedrick with the the um, with GSI and see if they've got something cooking that I don't know about. Um, what if the PDAs are supporting specific legislation? Say we got an email from Guthrie last week saying there's any bills that we that uh, we or the PD Northeast PDA could support. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. yeah, let's let's find out what they are and let's see if we can add it in. I'll reach out to Todd too. Are you aware of anything at the University District, Mary, that we might want to uh, try and factor in here? Um, I'm not, but I can check with Lars as well. Okay. All right. We will put some gray matter to this this week, uh, uh, Mike, and and uh, yeah. likewise. And let's let's tee up. Uh, let's let's revisit this next Monday if that's all right. Sure. And then, but and then, commissioners, so can we loosely start to pencil in a few dates? And my my thinking would be in December to invite legislators. I think it's going two dates out to the entire delegation and, you know, hopefully you get, you know, 80% of them to participate. Maybe you get all of them on one day and we cancel the other day or we, they divvy it up themselves. But that was just my thinking, throwing a couple of dates out there for their availability and present this to them. Yeah, no, that, I, I think okay. that would be a great idea. What do you think, Mary and Josh? You okay with that? Sure. Okay. Okay. I'll message Gina about trying to figure out a time to do that that isn't in maybe your regular business or maybe you want to be part of your regular business, but we'll get that figured out. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Take care, Mike. All right, Monty, are you going to talk about Liberty Lake TIFF? You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Classic Zoom mistake. Yep. Can you all hear me okay? Um, I'm sorry, can you hear me all right? You're really, no, we, we can can't hardly, hear can't you. hardly hear you there, buddy. Find the microphone volume, hang on, it's right here. We heard the classic Zoom mistake loud enough, but then all of a sudden oh, okay. you went out. Sorry, let's see if I can turn the volume up there. In theory, I know tech, but. Sorry. When you first got on, your volume was really good, but yeah. it's it's gone down. Okay, I don't know what it's doing. You might try turning your video off, Monty. Sometimes that helps. Okay. Oh yeah, hang on. Let me just fix that real quick. Sorry, it's my first. Let me just got older and weaker. He started strong. Yeah. It flies by. Monty, do you have headphones that have a speaker on it? Or microphone. Yeah. <laughs> my webcam has the microphone. That's good. It's a brand new install. Yeah, now your video is frozen, Monty. Yeah, I, hang on, give me a second. Your voice yeah. is better. Get, you're fading fast here. <laughs> <laughs> I, can just come, I can just come over. Can you call a friend, uh, you know? Uh, <laughs> you can call my phone, Monty. I'll put you on speaker. Dial a friend. <laughs> right, okay. That's not bad. It's not, I mean, That's not too bad. Out? We can turn them up. Yeah, let's see if we can turn him up a little bit. I don't know how his microphone volume is going. That we can hear. No, we're all, we're all, we're, all, we're maxed. Okay. I apologize. Um, so, Josh and Mary, can you hear Monty? 
Josh, can you hear me? I, 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 I could, yeah, yeah. Okay, Mary? I, I can faintly. Okay. I can Just, talk real loud, how about that? Yeah, there talk loudly. Yeah. yeah. All right, so this is, uh, can I share a screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what we're talking about today is uh, Harvest Parkway south of Mission. And it was uh, reimbursed with TIF lift money back in 2015, uh, built in 2014, we, reimbursement in 2015. Oh, before I get started, uh, this briefing is just informational. You will not need to take any action on this at all. Just uh, making sure that you're informed um, and get your questions answered about it. So uh, last year, uh, Western States CAT bought all the parcels around this south end of Harvest Parkway, and they requested uh, that it, the south end be vacated. Um, the city of Liberty Lake uh, agreed with that. Let me switch over to their ordinance um, and voted to vacate the southern portion here uh, depending on a few things, one of which was that uh, the TIF lift funds be reimbursed uh, back to the county because we're the manager of it. Um, and so they sent that over to us as a question and I uh, did run it by uh, legal and it's basically the law is kind of silent. It doesn't talk about reimbursements, but no one who's looked at it thinks it's a problem. So uh, it's basically been blessed that there's there's nothing preventing it from happening. It makes sense to, to reimburse the public funds since this portion is going to be uh, private now. Um, the city of Liberty Lake was going to have two people uh, join us, but since we were a little bit early getting started, RJ Stevenson uh, is what is going to be here. There's, if you have any questions I can't answer, we can just uh, wait for them to show up. But they're going to reimburse uh, Western States' 98000 back to the TIF lift fund. That's it. Okay. Any, any questions? questions? Any questions for Monty? And can you go back to the yeah. screen so I can see if. Okay, now I can see Mary and Josh. Any questions for Monty? Okay, very good. Thank you, Monty. Thank you. Thanks, Monty. So then we are cooking. <laughs> We get uh, Carrie on the line. Yep. Carrie is on the line, I think. Carrie is on the line. There she is. I'm here. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. I'm, I'm, I'm the invisible woman. No, 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 no. You're never. There's Lisa. <laughs> Trust me, I know difficult, and that's not you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the first one is uh, with uh, Gino. But he's not on the line yet. So, are there one of these others that we can uh, knock off while we're waiting for him to join us? Or is he on it? Is he on the line? Um, he should be. I just emailed him, and he said he's getting getting on right now. Oh, okay. All right. So, anything in general you want to share with us, Carrie, before we get to Gino on the line with us? Yeah, I've got a I've got a couple of uh, amendment requests. One came in from uh, oh daybreak when they did their when they did their uh salary um for that period of time that they were uh locked down and act as the isolation facility for teens he unfortunately missed his salary figure by about forty five thousand. so he um is respectfully requesting that we increase it from 104 thousand to um 149 000, and that will cover their total salary um, for that period of time that they acted as the isolation unit. Okay. And it is with, it is appropriate. It's an appropriate request. He's provided um, my office with the documentation that shows the period of time that was previously presented. Okay, any questions, Josh or Mary? Yeah, just, just making sure. So you, you approve that and you think that that meets the criteria and all of that since they're an isolation unit? 
correct. It was based on the, the prior approved um, request to the commissioners for that period of time. And it was the original one was how much again, Carrie? Uh, I believe it was 104,000, Mary, at that and then time. How much is this one? Uh, this is for 45. Okay, thank you. You think it's, and, and they're doing everything they need to show the salaries for, for um, time and effort and all that. They're, they're working on their time and effort certifications and we'll have everything, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm comfortable with their request. Okay, and I'm okay. Josh, your thoughts? Yeah, that that's okay. That's fine. You want to go ahead and make the motion? Yep, uh, Mr. Chair, move to approve an additional forty-five thousand dollars of CARES money for uh, Daybreak Youth Centers uh, CARES um, CARES eligible expenses as presented by Carrie Gridall. I'll second that. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Say none. All in favor say aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Key, are you here for the uh, Liberty Lake update on the uh, TIF? You're, you're on mute. My apologies. Yes, yeah, so, so um, RJ Stevenson, our Director of Finance, and myself are on to explain the TIF and lift reimbursement. Um, so uh, Harvest Parkway was constructed um, as uh, and reimbursed through tip and lift as part of the Toledo Station uh, short plat. Um, Western States bought three lots that are on the, the, the no, southern no, leg of it, the dog leg. Lisa, uh, Ms. Key, Ms. Key yes. uh, Monty Chamberlain already updated us this morning, so we've already dealt with this and we've moved on. So I think oh. we, we know all the information we need to know. <laughs> and, and, uh, don't okay. have any concerns. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. So I see that we have Gino uh, with us. So, uh, uh, Carrie, do you want to present, or Gino, do you want to take this? I'd be glad to do whatever uh, whatever uh, you guys like me to do. So. So why don't you give us a brief overview of your request? Okay. Well. Um, Basically, is as you may know, uh, or maybe you don't know, but <clears throat> Valley Fire, Spokane Valley Fire Department, recently came to you with a request uh, for some CARES grant uh, funding uh, for some uh, equipment to be utilized for COVID. Oh, there. I guess somebody popped it on the screen there. Can you still see me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. So, but yeah, so uh, originally we were going to be part of their plan, but uh, uh, since then we're told, well, we don't. Each agency kind of has to do their own thing. So, um, so I'll just I'll kind of start out with telling you a little bit about Fire District Four. Uh, for those of you that don't know anything about Fire District Four, we we cover the greater northern uh, part of Spokane County, about 330 square miles, uh, ten stations, five are volunteer and uh, five are staffed uh, 24 seven with a combination of, of volunteers and, and part-time personnel. And, and additionally, we have um, one unit that uh, is currently equipped and running uh, advanced life support with the paramedic on it, um, just kind of a chase unit throughout the district. So um, that being said, it, it poses some challenges sometimes. Um, Sometimes with our with our, our ambulance partners, we have the the lower third of our district is covered by American Medical Response, and uh, the northern two thirds of our district is covered uh, by Deer Park Ambulance. So, uh, as they continue to to be faced with staffing challenges and and ever ever increasing call demand, um, obviously we're 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 often left more time on scene. Uh, trying to treat a patient before we we actually get them uh, to the hospitals, and so um, that being said, we're trying to to really leverage uh, our response capabilities with some additional units, um, mostly uh, just with some of the equipment that you see in the request uh, before you today. Um, so, what we're looking to try to do is is purchase 
uh, two of each items, a, a Zoll uh, heart monitor, uh, portable ventilator slash CPAP type uh, machine, and uh, uh, auto pulse systems for CPR, and uh, of course the McGrath uh, video laryngoscopes. So um, looking, looking at some of those, and, I'll, and I can break some of them down for you and, and uh, let you know what our, what our plan is or, or the, the necessity for some of those equipment or items of equipment, so. But anyways, um, yeah, the, 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 our total request is $190,398, so uh, to, purchase, to purchase this equipment. And what we're, what we're looking at doing, like I said, is actually putting up uh, two more units strategically uh, located throughout our district, um, like I said, which is a 330 square mile area. Um, looking at, 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 at positioning units with the capability to, to reach patients faster. Um, with the concern of COVID, of course, we, we, are, we are starting to limit how many, how many individuals go in and actually make a patient contact um, to try and limit the exposure um, if, if we're told that, that there's a high, high index of suspicion that the person is, is uh, possibly COVID-19. So, um, so with the, the, the X-series monitors, you know, with, with that particular cardiac monitor, the advantage of it is it has an AED capability um, that can be utilized by a basic EMT. Um, additionally, it's a 12 lead cardiac capability that can be, can be utilized by paramedics. So anywhere from a, from a basic life support to advanced life support. Uh, additionally, it has you know, a temperature, uh, end tidal, uh, CO2 sensors on it. It has a, a, a oxygen sensor on it. Um, it can be viewed remotely through through um, a cloud system by a doctor uh, when we have the patient actually hooked up and and help us determine you know what's what's happening with the patient and the urgency of the patient care. Um, we could transmit the data to our um, our tablets that we're currently using for our EMS database and. Uh, as well as, as upload that, e, that, that data to our, our ambulance partners um, that, have, that have access to the, the uh, programs as well. So, um, so that's what the X-Series, and we're looking at two of them, like I said, just for two units. Uh, the same with the portable ventilators. One of the things that we've been really uh, uh, challenged with in Spokane County was a lot of our patients um, are required to, they're required to have some CPAP. Um, depending on if they're having a shortness of breath and, and we're using them uh, to treat with CPAP. The only challenge is, is there was nothing that was actually a closed circuit system uh, that was currently available to us. Um, so we've tried kind of finagling certain things to, to, to accomplish the, the uh, mitigation of the spread of aerosolizations uh, when we're trying to ventilate these patients or, or provide CPAP to them. So um, the ventilators we have can, or the, the ventilators I put in for is, is really one of two on the market that are, that are a closed circuit system a filtration device that, that actually captures the, the uh, potential contaminants. So thus decreasing the, the potential spread uh, to multiple individuals, especially during transport when we get them into to an ambulance and our paramedic rides in to assist with the patient um, being, being kind of uh, in the back of a little box in an ambulance for an extended period of time. And in our case, it's, it could be 30 minutes, it could be 45 minutes or longer if we're in the foothills of elk transporting all the way to Sacred Heart. So um, it, it, contains that, it contains that spread. And also we can, we can limit the number of individuals that we have to uh, send in with, with the ambulance and, and expose them because the, the ventilations and the CPAPs being done. Um, so one of the other things you, you see that we put in for is, is two auto pulse machines. And I, I think you're probably familiar with some of those. It's, it's basically a CPR machine. You know, it performs chest compressions, uninterrupted chest compressions, you know, for, for as, long as, as long as you need that, that machine to provide it for. Um, also, also limiting the exposure of, excuse me, of our individuals that are, that actually are, are down touching, touching the patient, um, you know, as, as they provide the care. We can easily load a patient in the ambulance with an auto pulse system, send them downtown, if, you know, if we, if we have pulses back um, and we don't have to send four or five people in so that they can rotate out effectively to do CPR. 
and, and exposing them as well. So, um, and, and then we can send it in. If the patient has a return of spontaneous circulation, they have pulses back, we can actually put it in place and transport with, with limited number of individuals, which allows the medic just to focus on trying to, to uh, make sure the vent's controlling the airway, the auto pulse is doing CPR compressions. They could be administering the, the necessary uh, drugs and everything to the patient during transport. Meanwhile, maintaining, uh, maintaining uh, seat belts without having to get up and try and do CPR, they can stay seat belted in. And so just from a safety standpoint, it's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great concept and uh, uh, definitely decreases the exposure and keeps additional units uh, in service. If I have to send somebody in for a, a, a cardiac arrest patient or a, or a potential that a patient's going to re, re-arrest and route to the hospital, I'm usually dropping uh, two units out of service uh, for the hour and a half that it would take to get somebody back into into our fire district. So, um, and then lastly, of course, is is McGrath uh, video laryngoscopes, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with those, but it's if you've ever seen intubations being done where they're they're down with a small little fiber optic light trying to uh, insert it into the airway, visualize the epiglottis, try and pass a an endotracheal tube through the epiglottis into the patient's lungs to breathe for them. Basically, you're down face to face with the patient in order to visualize it. Um, with with COVID, that's something here from a county protocol perspective. Uh, they've they've really um, tried steering us away from doing uh, just because it, we're so close proximity and and the potential of of, of spreading aerosolization or you know uh, not to be gross but sputum and and, and that kind of stuff, you know, onto, onto the first responders, it limits that. We can, we can keep our distance, place it in there with the, vi- with the video of the patient's airway. It has a screen on it. We can visualize the patient's airway quickly, uh, uh, you know, visualize the, the endotracheal tube passing the epiglottis and, and put it in, insert it within, within a matter of, of 20 seconds and uh, secure a patient's airway. So. Um, but anyways, that's, that's kind of the gist of our, of our, of our project there. Um, you know, it's, like I said, I know it's a lot to ask for, uh, but we're just trying to get at, at least two more, uh, two more units equipped versus having the one so that we can, we can just provide better care and, and, and offer the safety to, to our, our first responders. Kind of back to the ventilator as well. Um, one of the things that, that I don't know if you're aware of, but um, what they've discouraged us from using small volume nebul- nebulizers as well for folks that uh, are experiencing difficulty breathing, whether it's from uh, COVID, whether it's from uh, emphysema or COPD or asthma, um, to, to put an aerosolized uh, small volume nebulizer on them. They really discourage that because of the, again, the aerosolization, you know, in the, in the, the droplets and stuff that, that it produces. And so, you know, we have, we have been encouraged to, to take the patient's own little multi-dose inhalers with them to the hospital if, if they have them, if it's somebody that actually has a prescription for it. And, and, and uh, most of the time they don't, it's somebody that's experiencing some shortness of breath and uh, which is an acute onset. And, and definitely in the case of COVID, it's, you know, they're not, they're not gonna be prescribed until they, until they have a situation. Um, so, and those are on short supply as well. Uh, nationwide to try and to try and get a hold of those, uh, you may you may have even seen that on the news the, the shortage of of multi dose inhalers or or perhaps some of you have been challenged to get one yourself. But that's where the ventilator and everything is is it, it really assists us in the CPAP so that we can we can uh, uh, provide the ventilations, provide assistance to your breathing um, w- while minimizing exposure to to. Uh, potentially infectious uh, particles. So, anyway, sorry. Did, did you have a question, uh, Ms. Cuny? Yeah. So, so with with this ask, um, are you going to be able to get those, order those, and get those in time before the end of the year? That was one of the questions I had. I, I believe so. I believe so. I have reached out to to the vendors, the different vendors that provide these uh, these items. And of course, Zoll being one of them. Um, and we've dealt we've dealt a lot with Zoll in the past, and they're, they're always really good about uh, about providing the the uh, uh, or expediting the equipment. So 
Um, okay. But I do have spoke with everybody, inclu including the McGraths. The McGraths actually come, uh, they're designed to Stryker, is, is the one who actually uh, sells those. And, and talk with them, and they do, they do have some in stock, which they didn't at first, but now they do with COVID and, and the need for them. They, they have uh, increased their, their stock on them. So, okay. so yes, okay. I believe so, to answer your question. Okay, great. Because that's just one of the things we know that it's, you know, got to be, I, and, and I'm sure you're working with Carrie on that. And yeah. it, from Valley Fire did a great job of explaining this. He's, poor guy, we, we made him come back several times. So he's, he's explained a lot of this to us as well. Um, good, good. So we appreciate your, you know, your um, descriptions as well. Um, so uh, th thank you for all you're doing, because I know it's a tough times as well uh, for, for you. So um, appreciate that. And um, I don't have any further questions. I'm, I'm happy with, you know, adding this. I, you know, I think when we did the, the, uh, the request with Valley Fire that, you know, we see the need, you know, just as you explained for, you know, COVID purposes for the aerosolation of, of the um, germs that are going around. So um, it protects you and protects the patients. So thank you. All right. No, you're, cert you're certainly welcome. And uh, like I said, it's challenging times for everybody. And so, you know, not just us, just, you know, it's challenging times for everybody, you know, as a nation. So, um, yeah, and, and, and some of us, you know, one of the things I, did, I didn't say is that, you know, some of us fire districts are, are challenged a little more financially at times as well. So, you know, one of the things, because you may, you may be, be thinking, well, why, why didn't you, why don't you just add this to your 2021 budget or, or why don't you try and, and figure out how you're going to, to crunch the numbers to, to, to get some of this equipment right now? And, and unfortunately, the equipment's pretty spendy. And you know, being a fire district, you know, with the with the the taxes, or at least the first half of our taxes, you know, deferred uh, through through the end of the year here, you know, for for fire district four, it's about a five percent. We experience a five percent shortage in our budget this year, um, and, and and unsure how it's going to play out for 2021. But five percent doesn't seem like very much, but you know, for us, it's four hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and so. Um, to try and figure out how you're going to make up the four hundred twenty thousand dollars, you just you figure out what you're not going to do with, and so that's some of the things that we did through our cost saving measures already that we that we we continue to do right now, and it's just it's mission critical pieces or equipment that we're that we're spending money on right now, and so and that's just the everyday the everyday operational costs. So so there's been kind of an unexpected shortage in our budget um, this year, and so. It made it a little more difficult to plan. So, no, and we understand that. So, so I'm just going to double check. So, you said it was 19398. So, if we said like 191,000, just rounded it uh, to ensure that it covers all the shipping and tax and all that. Would that be the? It, it should be. Yeah, that should be definitely sufficient. One of the things that I did when I when I tried to get the the pricing on everything is is I included the the tax and the shipping estimations and stuff like that. So, but yeah, whatever, like I said, whatever you guys think is best, but uh, like I said, we're just, we're just appreciative for, for anything we can get. So. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner, this is Carrie. I, I reviewed it and I had it down as it's just a dollar difference, but I had it down as 193.99. So I don't know if you want to go a little bit above that. Are you one ninety four hundred just to? Yeah. Maybe that's that's the number. Just so. Josh. Okay, so I've I've heard about three different numbers. One ninety four hundred. Yeah. So the the last bid is uh, one ninety four hundred, but I'm open to more bids. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chair, I move to approve and authorize. CARES dollars of up to $190,400 um, to uh, facilitate the ask um, from Fire District 4 uh, as presented by Gino and Carrie Gridall today. I will second that. Okay, I've got a bid, I mean a motion and a second uh, to approve $190,400 uh, for uh, the Fire District number 4. 
uh, as discussed this morning. Uh, one question for you, Gina. Uh, you indicated that you have your operation has been impacted by the delay and the and the property tax collection. Is that uh, typical for all the fire districts? Are they all uh, kind of in a in a difficult situation right now? And is it how has that impacted your ability to provide fire protection? Well, like I said, we we have we've continued to just try and, and, and manage the best we can, you know, uh, you know, cutting a lot of different cost um, and just, and just managing the, like I said, the best we can to, to, to just critical mission things. So it's, you know, it has, it has prohibited us from buying a lot of, a lot of things, you know, uh, perhaps some wants or, or some different projects that we're, we're going to have to put off for another year or two. Um, you know, anything from, you know, trying to fill the cracks in our parking lots to whatever. So, um, okay. so we, we're, we're trying to uh, mitigate the, the extra spending that way. As far, as far as your question there on, on the other districts, I think it, I think it just varies on the districts. You know, um, okay. I know some districts that, that, you know, were, had, had lost less. Um, some districts that it, it didn't, it didn't really impact at all because there was, you know, so much housing and everything and development in their, in their areas that it, that it kind of helped offset that, so they didn't they didn't experience much of a shortfall. But um, I think I think it's probably pretty status quo that somebody everybody's impacted a little bit at least. So okay, thank you. Any other questions? Discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect. The motion passed unanimously. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you very much, everybody. You bet. That gets us to. Uh, Tanya Koblock uh, with Sticks Diabetes Program. Tanya, I saw you on the screen. There you are. Floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm going to assume that you do not know who Sticks Diabetes Programs is and just quickly tell you a little bit about us. We are a nonprofit organization, <clears throat> excuse me, that's been around for about 20 years at this point. We serve the type one diabetic community for children in our area. Um, I, again, I'm not gonna assume you guys know, but type one diabetes is not something that a child um, ends up with because they have consumed too much sugar. Type one diabetes is a disease that attacks the pancreas of the child. Um, unfortunately, I learned this the hard way about four years ago when we ended up in the emergency room with our youngest son who was diagnosed. Um, right now, uh, we, are, we try to partner with Sacred Heart Medical Center, uh, the Pediatric Endocrinology Office. Uh, they are diagnosing about 15 children every single month right now. They are life flighted from um, Southern Idaho, from uh, Tri-Cities. We have them coming in at uh, increased numbers that we just we don't know how to handle. So out of that was born Stix Diabetes Programs. Uh, we began many years ago just as a summer camp and it was a one week long camp. We actually would welcome families and parents as well because we used it as an opportunity to educate families on how to live with this horrible disease. Uh, it has grown. We now 20 years later have three camps. We start with the six to eight year olds, um, over 50% of those kiddos are newly diagnosed. Um, we, it's a weekend, just a weekend camp. We then have our nine to 16 year old camp and it is a one week residential camp. We currently just partnered with YMCA Camp Reed. So we rent a week from them uh, growing. We might possibly need to rent two now. And then last year, we started our adventure camp and that is for our 16 to 19 year old youth uh, trying to help them transition from what it means to be a child under the care of your parents, grandparents, um, aunts and uncles to now learning how to live in this world while you manage this disease that um, takes over every single second of your day. COVID unfortunately hit us really hard. We, every March, we have our main fundraiser. It is our dinner auction. It has grown. This year, we would have had 500 people at our dinner auction. Uh, if you guys are um, familiar with the dates in Spokane, our auction was supposed to take place on Saturday, March 14th. 
And on Friday, March 13th, the mandate came down that we could not meet. Um, devastating probably is an understatement as the monies that we net from that dinner option covers us uh, for our camps for the following year. Uh, we tried to quickly pivot and turn it to, uh, we had the items that our generous community had given us for the auction portion. Many of our sponsors just hung right through with us, allowed us to keep their dollars, knowing that it was gonna go to the children. Um, and so we, we were able to, to pivot to an online auction, which was wonderful. Um, however, for us, there were a lot of lost expenses uh, that we would not be able to, to recoup. Um, continuing on beyond that, we had to make the hard decision to cancel. Our, our first camp of the year would have been our one week residential camp. We had to cancel that camp. For us, it was trying to figure out how do we still reach these families? How do we still reach these 300 kids that were going to be at this camp? Um, we decided to, I'm sure many of you have heard a lot of camps this summer went virtual looks very, very different. So again, costs associated with that, we decided to ship the kids um, kind of camp in a box. Many of the items that we did not actually ask for as lost expenses, you know, typically the kids will get t-shirts in their boxes or t-shirts at camp. Um, those are items we were already expecting to purchase, but the box itself, the shipping for the boxes, um, feeding all of our volunteers as they came to pack the boxes, items like that are expenses that we were not ex uh, expecting this year. Um, moving forward, we then had to cancel our adventure camp. We had to cancel our camp twigs for our younger campers. So we used that same um, idea and we did a camp in a box. We had a virtual meetup with the families. Um, it all went as well as it could this year. Uh, however, our adventure camp teenagers, it's been a real hit for them. I think losing that sense of being together. So we um, have purchased Zoom platforms. We are going with a quarterly virtual meetup with those families. Uh, the one thing that was highlighted for our organization, um, even more so was how devastating the loss of connection are for these families. So the pediatricians uh, within the endo office at Sacred Heart, uh, who typically, um, they're the ones actually, a lot of them that would sit on our board of directors. Uh, we've tried to separate that out a little bit more just because they work so hard in their daily jobs and then the hours they volunteer in our organization are so great that we try to fill our board with other, um, other just you know, community members, uh, family members and whatnot. Uh, but they came to us and said, we've, we've got to do something else. We need, to, we need to reach out to these families during this time. So we decided to um, hire just with a, under a $10,000 uh, contract, a community outreach coordinator. And this individual is going to help us reach the families. Unfortunately, right now, again, it's just via Zoom, um, trying to meet up with these families. But again, this is an expense that at some point we were hoping sticks is growing. At some point we were hoping to hire on a community outreach coordinator knowing that just trying to reach these kids for one week a year is not enough. We need to be reaching these families every single month. Uh, we need other opportunities to get together with them. Um, so we brought Cindy on as our community outreach coordinator to try to help us kind of bridge this gap right now. So she works very closely with the doctors at Sacred Heart Peds Endo in this partnership. Um, she is going to be a volunteer at the hospital now. Um, obviously, HIPAA is huge. We have to be very careful. They can't just say, hey, here's a family, contact them. So Cindy's able to go in when these children are newly diagnosed. She's able to see them in the hospital, connect them with our STICS community. And then when they leave the hospital, we kind of wrap our arms around them and help carry them through. So my ask today, which is now highlighted on your screen, is really just it's the loss, it's the expenses that we had that we are not able to recoup. And it, I guess in the grand scheme of the millions of dollars that are um, right now uh, able to be given out to the community in, in Spokane, I know this is a smaller number, but for us, it makes or break our organization. And we really could use, unfortunately, we've also made the decision we're not gonna be able to have our dinner auction again this next year. So this will now be two years that we're losing a majority of our dollars to try to help these kids. 
So this is the dollars that you see on the screen right now is just simply to help cover our lost expenses that COVID has created for us. Okay, thank you, Tanya. So uh, Josh or Mary, do you have any questions for uh, Tanya or any questions about the request? Yes, so um, I, I just would like to have Carrie speak to it a little bit um, just because um, Tanya, you know, we can't take care of lost revenues, which is in, you know, I know you're asking. Yeah. So, so sometimes as we're talking, it kind of gets convoluted that way. But sure. it's like based on your spreadsheet that this is for actual expenditures due to COVID that were unanticipated um, that your organization is experiencing. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And, and I worked very closely with Carrie as I went through this and was able, she was so amazing and open and available to me and we went back and forth and you know the lost revenue would be more of the two to two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar yeah. actually not including our camp and we offered the the camps free for the kids this year the virtual camps so this is just simply expenses and not just camp expenses these are expenses that we had outside of what we would have done for camp which was in our regular budget this is in addition because of COVID that we had, like the shipping of the items, um, the Zoom platforms, all of the stuff that we've had to do because of COVID or the lost, you know, the food that we had to pay for that, uh, for the auction that's lost. It was all of the stuff once COVID hit, these are dollars that were lost, expenses that were lost. Okay, great. So, so Carrie, I'll just ask to make sure that you've gone through this and you're comfortable that these are appropriate expenditures. Yes, Commissioner, I have. Uh, Tanya worked really hard to get this down. Again, we kind of went back, you know, into the thing that can't be loss of revenue, but these were expenses that they occurred due to the interruption um, via COVID, including the costs that they incurred for lost food for their event with having one day's notice, um, a lot of the costs that they incurred um, for the actual event that would be covered. I, I see this under a couple of different things. It's a small business, um, uh, grant program, as well as expenses that have resulted directly to them to uh, reach out to these families that they wouldn't have otherwise had not COVID hit our community. So we've gone through this pretty, pretty closely with uh, fine tooth comb, so to speak. Great. Thank you very much. Then I okay. think I. Ferns. All right. Um, I. I support this. I, I, I think it's great. Um, uh, it, are there any other questions before I, before I make a motion? No, nope, floor's yours. Okay. I'd, I'd love to make some, uh, some sticks band puns, but I don't know how many people would get them. So I, I'm just not going to. Um, but, uh, oh, Commissioner, I would. I would. <laughs> We'll, we'll I'd like to hear him. <laughs> well, I, 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 must, I must say, I, I had to Google to look up a few stick songs, but uh, so, no, no, you know, in, in this year, nothing ever goes as planned. Um, and, uh, you know, Carrie Gridall, thank you for, you know, show, show me the way, you know, to, to get this done. You could have called me. I would have given you the names of the songs too, Commissioner. <laughs> that was a pretty good one, though. <laughs> Yeah. That was pretty good, Josh. Yeah, good thing you got a day job. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, I move to approve and authorize uh, CARES Act funding um, up to the amount of $31,300 uh, to cover the, um, uh, the COVID-related expenses uh, for sticks presented today. I will second that motion. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate everything you're doing and you've made a, um, sorry, you've made a real difference. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care. <laughs> all right, next uh, we have up uh, Nicole Adamson Wood from Spark. Hi everyone. Floor I'm is yours. Gonna, oh, excuse me. I, Floor is yours. Thank you. I am actually going to turn this over to our executive director, uh, Brooke Matson, who is also on the line here. All right. 
Thank you, Nicole. And um, are we able to share our screen? Uh, it's up. Oh, okay. Up. Great. We we had uh, some slides for you, but but this will work. Um, so we. Oh. You can go ahead and share. Okay. You can go ahead and share. I think Nicole's gonna get that. Up. Awesome. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so we. Um, well, thank you for letting, giving us your time today. Um, we wanted to um, share with you how we've pivoted our strategy during COVID-19 to respond to certain needs um, that we're asking your help for today. Um, so we are a nonprofit that's all about breaking barriers to creativity um, so that people of all economic backgrounds can create the future that they imagine. And we focus on children in that effort. Um, so prior to COVID, we met our mission by having a robust creative station that was open five days a week to kids dropping in after school and to families um, for educational enrichment um, and mentor, uh, well, light mentorship, you know, working with our volunteers to access technology and books and opportunities. We also had a robust um, program. Uh, calendar, including summer camps, including um, drop-in after-school activities, which we saw many West Central youth come to, um, as well as um, weekend programming for families. Obviously, um, and we, we very much focus in on the West Central neighborhood of Spokane because it's an under-resourced neighborhood, which I'll talk more about later. Uh, and during, during COVID, we really realized we would not be able to run our station, we wouldn't be able to run most of our programming. Um, and so we really took a, a moment to think about who is it that needs to be served right now. And we looked at our mission and realized, you know, part of why we do what we do, and everyone says, why is creativity so important? It's important because um, we need kids to be able to create the future and create their own future. And if they don't have access to opportunities and education, um, which we call it the opportunity and education gap, um, they won't be able to do that. And we know that in our neighborhood that primarily affects low-income families, families of color, um, students from, that come from homes with lots of trauma, of which there's a lot of in the West Central neighborhood, um, which West Central has one of the highest rates of poverty in Washington. So um, we serve, we work with Audubon and Holmes Elementary traditionally, mostly homes. But during the pandemic, we, we took a moment and we have a quote on the next slide that um, uh, I think embodies kind of our thinking in March and April um, that, you know, the seismic shifts in teaching and learning driven by the pandemic are only going to become exacerbated um, and exacerbate those opportunity gaps unless we focus on the highest need students. And so that's what we decided to do and we entirely pivoted our organizational program strategy to be um, uh, it's for a couple of programs. We put out 200 creative kits to West Central youth. Um, we delivered some of those and some of the, the families that live closer to us were able to pick those up. Um, we did two rounds of those. Um, we brought all of our summer camps um, that serve West Central youth online so that we could still serve kids and we created packages that they then picked up. Um, or we brought to them uh, so that they would have the materials for the summer camps to do via Zoom and we got our Zoom memberships up. Um, and then we really took a hard look at fall and knowing that kids, I mean, as you know, the um, Spokane Public Schools went online in the spring pretty rapidly and a lot of kids fell through the cracks. The kids that traditionally come to Spark after school could live in low income housing, um, the parents are often single parents. Um, they're working, you know, difficult hours. They're not able to stay at home and do schoolwork with their kid and um, guide them through activities. Um, and we knew that a lot of these kids were just largely unsupervised at home. So, um, so we decided in the fall to launch our Level Up program, which is going to be, um, I, we think, a new cornerstone program for us. It was an immediate response to the needs of COVID and that we said, you know, we can't serve as many people as we used to, but we're going to make two cohorts and we worked with Spokane Public Schools to do that. We have a Holmes Elementary cohort that meets twice a week and an Audubon cohort that meets twice a week. Um, they're screened at the door uh, for all, you know, temperature taking, masks, the whole bit. 
um, social distancing. And um, in the, I'm very proud of the program we've developed for these kids because they're with us from 1 to 4.30. Um, they get homework help. So their second half of their school day, they're, they're working with us and mentors because we know mentorship is important. They're getting reading time and reading assistance. Uh, they're doing STEAM projects um, and they're forming clubs. So we have like a Minecraft world building club, a coding club, a robotics club, arts and crafts club. Um, so these kids are getting enrichment during the second half of their school day and after school. They're getting mentorship, they're getting homework and academic assistance that is really gonna have a big impact on uh, that would otherwise they would be falling behind right now um, because we know that their families just can't cope with putting food on the table as well as you know being home with their kid to guide them through um, exercises. So um, Spokane Public Schools is trying to work with us to find transportation for this program. Um, but we're really, um, and, and we've been working with the principals to make sure that the kids that they're identifying for this program are low income. Um, many of them have IEPs and are youth of color um, or have other needs that this program assists them with. Um, so I'm gonna let Nicole talk a little bit more about some of the specifics in the program. Um, thank you, Brooke. Oops, am I on mute here? Let's see now. Okay. Um, really, I think the key things, what we're doing with Level Up is that it's structured academic supports that we have worked and are working closely with, um, not only at the Spokane Public School level, but also with individual schools. So um, as Brooke mentioned, Homes and Audubon principals and staff are identifying students that are most in need of this program so that they're they're getting the supports that they need. Um, we are focusing heavily on social and emotional learning and following best practices for those. Um, and again, working with Spokane Public Schools to develop those, um, those skills. Um, and then our, our program for the students is also focused on those STEAM um, opportunities um, that a lot of kids get, you know, if it, a lot of kids get in other places and these students really are not getting. And what's great about this is that the students are sort of leading the way on what clubs they want to do. And as we progress through this throughout the year, they'll be able to um, start their own clubs if they have an interest for something. So it's also going to give them that, you know, that leadership component as well. Um, our staff um, is we have trained staff and mentors and we are continuing to provide that professional development with them so that they're in line with um, you know the standards that the that OSPI is directing um, and then you know to make sure that we're doing this I don't know if any of you have had the chance ever to come by spark but it's um, it is a space that really invites creativity and innovation um, and we're glad that you know we can't have everyone back in right now but we we can at least provide that space for some of these students um, who don't have a place to go right now so and then brooke already mentioned it's we're intentionally focused on um on those students who are most in need and, and who aren't able to have you know parents sitting at home with them helping their digital learning and then as we move through this um what we're really looking forward to is that these students will be getting year-round supports because they'll go right from you know when school ends in May they'll have the opportunity to do summer camps with us as well and then as the more people we can have as we progress through these phases we'll be able to open those up to other students as well but hopefully we'll be able to have these students year-round and then um, you know the goal is that we'll develop those mentoring capabilities in them and they'll be able to in turn come back and be mentors for us someday so one of one of the, so what we're asking you for today is um, support for the incredible staffing effort that this took um, to pivot essentially to change our, our programming. Um, so we did get a paycheck protection uh, program loan and uh, are applying for forgiveness for that, but that did not cover um, all of the staff time for to, to do this. Um, also, the expenses of this in terms of youth masks, um, you know, all the PPE required, the extra supplies that we weren't anticipating buying. Um, you know, we make sure that all of the kids have their own water bottles, you know, for safety. 
Um, we give them uh, multiple snacks per day. Um, and then all of the creative care, care packages, that was a, another expense we did not anticipate. So, um, so the, the money that you'll be giving us will be direct, direct expenses for this program. And it, we wanted to open it up and see if you guys had any questions for us um, in terms of, you know, the, the response that we're providing to students during COVID. Okay, so uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Carrie, you've had a chance to review this application. Your thoughts? Yes, commissioners. It does meet, again, kind of it's a small business grant, the expenses that uh, were incurred uh, as a result of COVID. The staff, uh, uh, staff costs were, were incurred as a result of needing more um, programs to cover uh, kids being out of school. The costs requested fall within the period of March 1 to December 31. Um, they're appropriate. Uh, I've worked closely with the staff to uh, reduce some of the earlier costs that would not have been COVID uh, covered. So the current proposal as it sets does cover um, costs that would be allowable. Okay, any questions uh, either uh, Josh or Mary? Um, I guess I just want to just ensure, um, so this is in addition to what District 81 is doing with some of their other day camps, are you considered part of their day camps? No, and, and in fact, I think, so, so they do offer scholarships, but you have to apply for those, and it is a pay-to-play program, essentially. Um, and so our program, what part of our mission is that we do not charge youth for programming um, in our neighborhood. So, um, so, so this program is entirely free. Um, the principals are, when they talk to parents, are saying like, you know, this is a, a free option for you guys and many of the parents, what we're hearing from parents is they're desperate for a solution. Um, but yeah, we're not part of the, the public schools day camp program. Um, they are trying to get us identified though as a learning, uh, like a learning site. Um, so that we can get busing. That hasn't happened yet, but we're hoping that will happen soon. Okay, thank you. Just, yeah, yeah. I mean, making sure we're not, you know, doing, doing that. But no, I, um, I am, I'm obviously very, very uh, supportive of the youth programs that we can do to support kids during this time because it's just critical um, so they don't get further behind. So I'd be very supportive. Okay, Josh, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm, I, I think this, this sounds good. J just want to confirm that, that the ask from us is the, the highlighted number, the, the, the 46669. Yeah. All right. Okay, floor is yours, Josh. All right, Mr. Chair, uh, move to approve um, CARES dollars in the amount of up to $46,670 to uh, facilitate the uh, level up creative care packages and remote uh, summer learning camps as presented uh, today. Yes, it's, it's for actually Spark Central is the name of the organization. Oh yeah, I, I, I was just reading the title on the page, but yes, yeah. for, for, for Spark, for their level up creative care packages, remote summer learning camps. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, um, I will yep. second the motion. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It makes such a difference for us, so thank you so much. Very good. So, next item is uh, uh, Lisa Deffley uh, talking about the women and children. So, Lisa, you're got the floor. Good morning, thank you. So I'm Lisa Diffley, I'm the Executive Director of Women and Children's Free Restaurant. We're located at 1408 North Washington Street in Spokane, and I have been in my role since 2014. So I wanna thank you for hearing my request for funding today. It totals $266,479. Uh, we are here to address uh, one of the most basic needs of our community, that is hunger and food insecurity. And we've seen a, a remarkable need for our services since March of this year. Um, 
Spok Spokane has been the home to women and children's free restaurants since 1988. We are part of the community's food services, emergency and otherwise, and we are relied on by those who come to the restaurant and through our collaborative work with other nonprofits. Um, we had three programs operating prior to COVID, and that was our restaurant meals program where folks came to the restaurant and dined in-house three times a week. We had Nutrition to Go, which was meal outreach, to working with up to 30 other nonprofits in the community. And then we offered nutrition education at the restaurant in our classroom. Uh, operating now is our restaurant meals through, a, through the transformed uh, nature of it now, which is curbside services. Nutrition to Go continues and we are um, delivering and distributing meals to right now 19 other locations in the community. So we operate a large commercial kitchen and that's why we have the capacity to do that. We are a low barrier, particularly now, so that folks have access to prepared meals and groceries. And the curbside portion of what we're doing is uh, two days a week. We have folks coming to the restaurant, they're coming into the area, into the parking lot, and we're uh, distributing food in that, in that fashion, much like any other restaurant in town. We don't charge for our services. We raise all of our own funds. So for this year, we budgeted 100, uh, for 100,000 meals, which would have been our biggest year in the history of our organization, and that's about 2,000 meals a week. But um, everything changed in March, and so as soon as the stay home order was issued, I pivoted our services, moving to curbside because we were not able to have folks come into our restaurant, and also knowing that we'd serve far more outside of the restaurant. So the first week, we were up to 6,800 meals. So about, you know, three and a half times what we were normally doing. Last week, we provided over 42,000 meals. That's our biggest week to date. We've been averaging somewhere between 28 and 30,000 meals, but we will serve 900,000 meals this year. We, we may reach a million. So every week, we are seeing new families coming to a restaurant that have, that have needed uh, food support for the first time in their lives. These are folks that are out of work. Um, some of them were slow to the process. There's a lot of shame associated with this, but we've tried to make this a, the most dignified experience that we can because we feel that everyone deserves good food, no matter where they are in life, and we continue in that way. So in addition to the curbside services, I provided you a list of organizations that we support and 70% of those organizations currently are also providing shelter. So that's the collaborative effort that we, that we have with them is that we are providing the food, they're providing the housing. And low barrier has taken on a little bit of a new meaning for us because you know being a traditionally a women's organization and we will always be a women and children's organization, we've We've been serving uh, shelters that are um, housing men, co-ed, that sort of thing, so that the food is available. And I think what makes our organization so unique and uh, necessary in Spokane County is that we have the capability to prepare the meals. And as you can understand, most um, folks can use groceries and that kind of thing, and we, we do uh, pass on groceries to folks. But there are, um, barriers to and, and limited capacity and resources for people to prepare their own food. So then uh, this is particularly important to all the shelters that we're serving. So some of those organizations I know you're familiar with, Catholic Charities, Volunteers of America, Family Promise, Transitions, the YWCA, and many, many others. And um, so that, that work continues and is now operating seven days a week, and that includes the um, shelter that's being operated now by the Salvation Army. We provide meals there three days a week. And um, we are usually the go-to organization for warming centers, which is coming up. And um, we also uh, supported the city's efforts to get folks inside during the uh, 
uh, for the cleaner air shelter that was operated in the convention center um, just a couple of months ago. So that is what, what, what we're doing. And we're, um, you know, typically we, we operate with 150 volunteers coming in every week. Well, a lot of those folks have decided that they need to stay home and protect their health. It is a lot of retired people, um, in some cases students, and um, that number has dwindled down to about 35 at this time. Over the last quarter, we had a total of 78 different volunteers come in to help us. And we operate with a small staff. We have 7.5 full-time employees. And um, you know, we're all working um, hard to meet the demands, the seven day a week um, and the growth, which has just been phenomenal for our organization. So I've, I've asking for support for these families and these organizations. In a, it looks like a, what I told Carrie was a kitchen sink sort of request, but I wanted to bullet that out for you so you could see directly where we want the money to go. And it starts with food. And there is a lot of food that has um, been distributed in our community. We are aware of that. And we are one of the organizations that, that gets grocery boxes to families. But with the kind of work that we're doing in a commercial kitchen, we need um, supplemental food that is, you know, large scale, not, um, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of small cans and small uh, containers of peanut butter, little bags of rice, that kind of thing. We, we operate at a much higher volume of that than that. So we, we do need the funding for supplemental food. And our food budget has grown tremendously this year, as you can imagine, as it relates to the numbers that I've shared with you. In addition to that, we've, we've had to purchase an, a number of um, pieces of equipment to just set up the operation. I mean, tents and signage and equipment, carts, you know, everything that you can imagine that puts on a massive food distribution uh, right outside of our building. And in that, um, equipment list is a machine that we need to individually package meals and um, I've been looking into the that possibility and so I've I've put in that um, machine in the in the total in the equipment purchases and right now we are operating we, you know we individually package meals on a small machine that is manually operated and we're looking at a piece of equipment that would package 27 you know, healthy, fully composed meals per minute. So that is an important request for us and it would really take some uh, of the heat, <laughs> literally off of our kitchen team that is trying to uh, package these meals in the old fashioned way that we could do when we were at 100,000, but not as we are now. The other piece of equipment that's an important one is the combination oven, which is a Typical piece of equipment that you would see in a large commercial kitchen. We've never really had the capacity or focus to purchase one of those, but it is a game-changing game piece of equipment in a commercial kitchen. And I, most schools have these and, and large organizations like that. We want one and um, the, that piece of equipment in itself would produce about 660 meals at one time. So it, it is definitely a game changing piece of equipment for a commercial kitchen. Um, the other equipment is a walk-in freezer. I did not have an option not to move ahead with that project, but I borrowed to do so because I had um, large beef donation from um, local cattle raiser that um, contributed to us, so I had to be prepared to accept that beef. Beef is very difficult to get and uh, donated, and so we wanted to be prepared for that and, and just to be ready to, um, you know, have food ready in more in advance than what we'd done before with these numbers. And then the next request I have in here is for overtime wages, and we've you know, we've managed overtime as well as we as we can, but um, you know, we've gone over uh, what was budgeted for the year, and that is a, a smaller number in relation to the others. Uh, we have a garage door that we've absolutely worn out, and so we are manually operating a very large metal garage door, which is an important piece of our building since we're in and out of there bringing food in and out consistently. 
and um, we have a request for safety and cleaning, which is you know definitely added to our budget this year. We've we've received donations for that type of thing when we can, but we it, it isn't fulfilling all the needs that we have. And then the la the last item on this request is is kind of a special one. We we did a test pilot last month to distribute $25 gas cards to the folks that come to the restaurant to receive meals. And it was a successful, um, of course. I mean, people want those gas cards, but they, they need the card, they need the support really to keep at coming and getting the food that they need. And so that went well and smoothly. I think it doubled our numbers that day, but I, you know, we would like to continue to do that for folks and it was um, just to give you an idea of how we piloted that we we worked with a local organization that um, provided the funds for us to buy the gas cards and we went to a local company that sells the gas cards and of course they were happy to receive the business and then they actually gave back generously to our organization so that we would have the gas to run our own delivery van so a, a good plan and we'd like to be able to continue that for our community for, throughout the year. So these are the, these are the requests and um, I would love to hear any questions that you have and thank you. Any questions for Lisa? Um, yeah, I'm going to start with some of them. So Carrie, you know, it's going to be, you know, I think you've gone through this, you feel comfortable. So on the gas cards, I guess, you know, again, these are expenditures that are through the end of the year that, um, you know, and can all these things be purchased and in place by the end of the year? Yes, that's a great question. I, I spent some time on this as soon as I um, considered per submitting this proposal, working with each of the vendors on the machinery specifically mm -hmm. and then because that's you know i want to make sure that is available but as far as the gas cards yes and so i've got that mapped out to happen each week through the through the end of the year okay and then um i have to say i mean i've, I've heard a lot about and, and been in organizations where we've had lunches served by you but um i i did not realize that you're doing all the you know a lot of the food for all these different organizations so um Kudos to you. I mean, that's, I mean, I see this as a great win, you know, to, to help you than to help you know, a lot of our homeless community and, and all of that. And I, and, and one question I have just, you know, knowing a little bit, then you also, part of your volunteers is having people from shelters come and work there as well. Is that to kind of help give them skills to get them back on their feet? Um, we haven't done, a, a, we've done some of that, not a lot of that. Okay. Um, you know that that is definitely something that we're always exploring um it is a it, it is a professional kitchen okay with you know we have all the chefs that work for me um that work with me are all culinary trained professionals and so they have that skill set to train we've done um during right now of course we're distancing in our facility so it right. makes it a little bit tricky and we we want to make sure that our that we keep engaging our regular volunteers as much as possible like i said a lot of retired people in the community nurses and so on want to give back and so we want to keep that robust because you know we see those numbers coming back up over time but but we you know and the other thing that we do that we'll we'll do again is in our nutrition education uh piece of it we've got folks from shelters and we also visit other shelters and teach them how to cook not for just themselves but also the job skills great thank you and so so i guess carrie it's you know is are you comfortable with this request yes i am commissioner also uh lisa and i talked about the need on the gas cards you know to set up some kind of process where people sign off so we have a easily traceable document for auditing purposes so lisa and i'll be working uh together on on that piece of it but i'm very comfortable um we've talked about having the equipment you know be here before december 30th so i think i pretty much have have gone through everything with lisa up to this point to ensure that it falls within the time frame and it meets the cares act requirements great thank you no, I, I see it as continuing to provide food security and food security, you know, sometimes it's not just, 
you know, like at Second Harvest, but also then getting food out to these organizations. So thank you. Thank Josh, you. Your concern, Josh, do you have any comments? No, I'm, I'm good. I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, uh, maybe this is more for Terry. Terry, how do we, um, how do we uh, make a garage door COVID related? Well, we do in that sense because it's for the delivery of the food. It's okay. actually related into the actual, because they, they do food delivery out to these, all of these locations. That's, that's how it's related. Okay. And because they're using it more, um, it's really related to their operations commissioner. Okay. And then uh, with regard to the gas cards, um, are you feel comfortable that there's a way to uh, put into place a program to monitor the gas cards so that the cards can't be sold for cash uh, that then uh, goes back to the individuals as opposed to being used for ca uh, gas? Yes, I believe we can do so. Uh, Lisa and I can talk about that further, but you know, as far as uh, I think her pilot project uh, that she put into place, and I've been involved with other projects like this in the community in the past, there are things you could put into place to ensure that they're sold for cash. Okay, okay, very good, thank you. So uh, back to you, Mr. Kearns. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, I move to approve and authorize um, CARES dollars expenditures in the amount of, or up to $266,497 dollars to the women and children free restaurant and community kitchen as presented today. I'll second that. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. I, I deeply appreciate your support and uh, we will take care of the community with this money. Very good. Okay, next item is uh, Mr. Petrovich for uh, a couple of minutes. This is just to give us a heads up. Uh, Gary. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, this is uh, along the lines of some house, housekeeping issues, but we do uh, need to schedule a hearing uh, on Monday the 16th to bring before the board uh, possible tax considerations that could affect the 2021 budget. Um, those include the uh, the 1% property tax increase and uh, possible uh, road levy shift. As you know, the, the uh, 2021 taxes must be certified in a public hearing no later than November 30th. So what we're asking for is the approval uh, of notice of a public hearing that would occur on November 16th on a Monday. And just for clarification purposes, this does not mean that we're going to use that tax, but because it is a uh, revenue option available to us, we have to provide notice uh, of it to the public and stuff, much like we've done in past years. So any objection to putting this on the 16th? So I need a motion to authorize putting it on for the 16th. Chairman French, this yes, is sir. Mr. Maciel. What we would ask is that we have the clerk place the notice of public hearing on tomorrow's consent agenda. It's all ready to go. That might be simpler. Gina? I thought you wanted it approved today. So we, we, we can do it Friday. We can do it tomorrow, we could do it tomorrow though and still meet the 10 day publication. Is that not true? Yeah. yeah so we can place it on tomorrow's uh, consent agenda, Commissioner French, with your direction. Okay, anybody object to that? I'm fine. Okay. Let's make it happen. Very good. Thank you. Then I'm assuming, Mr. Hansen, this is executive session. So um, we are going to move into an executive session for the purposes of discussing labor negotiations and also uh, pending or potential litigation. I'd like to have you stay for the pending or potential litigation or come back for the pending. That's going to be the last 30 minutes. So we'll do the first 30 minutes as labor negotiations. You guys aren't going to take more than 30 minutes, are you? 
Okay. Is it going to take less than 30 minutes? No. Okay. Is anyone going to be zooming in? No. The only ones that will be zooming in are uh, uh, Mary and Josh. I'm going to lock the meeting then. Still lock the meeting. When we're through the executive session, we will adjourn that we've no action taken as a result of the executive session. Okay. All right. 30 minutes for executive session of labor negotiations. And the ones participating will be Mr. Hansen, Mr. Withrow, Mr. Anderson, and our uh, senior management staff. Then the second executive session will be our senior management staff and Mr. Maceo. Okay.